Well, hello there, watching the press preview. A first look then at what is on the front pages. Time to see what is making the headlines with the columnist and broadcaster Steve Richards and the former government special advisor Salma Shah. Lovely to see both of you. So, as ever, we turn our attention to those front pages. The Metro carries claims from the Conservative MP, William Ragg, that Tory whips have been known to threaten MPs to withhold funding from their constituencies if they don't support the Prime Minister. The Guardian has the headline, Tories using dirty tactics to get MPs to back Johnson. The Eye describes the intra-party turmoil as a Tory civil war over Boris Johnson's future. The Star has sent a journalist in a duck costume to Downing Street, suggesting the Prime Minister might be a lame one. The Telegraph hears that some schools are still telling pupils they need to wear masks, contradicting the government's instruction that they can stop as of today. The Mail says the Prime Minister is facing a battle with unions who are resisting his efforts to get workers to return to their offices. In the Express, the Chancellor is said to be considering a plan to offer £500 payouts to help people with their energy bills. And the Financial Times reporting that the Ukrainian president has taken offence after Joe Biden suggested the US wouldn't get involved if Russian movement into Ukraine turned out to be a minor incursion. Well, a quick reminder before we hear from our guests, but by scanning the QR code you will, you'll see on your screen during the programme, uh, you can check out the front pages of tomorrow's newspapers while you watch. So, let's speak then to Steve Richards and Salma Shah. Great to see both of you. Salma, what is going on? Is this all normal or is something really going wrong in the work of the whips? Well... It's, it's actually not normal, and it's it's definitely not normal to expose the work of the whips. They're supposed to be in the shadows, usually, sort of whispering into people's ears and um, ensuring that, you know, discipline and order is maintained. Um, I think what's interesting about this is that we saw this reprieve um, for the most part of today granted to the Prime Minister after the defection and David Davis's intervention yesterday. But then you had William Ragg give a statement at the, at the beginning of his committee session, of which he's chair, the Public Administration Committee in the Commons, um, laying out very clearly that uh, whips have been behaving uh, inappropriately or pressure has been applied from the whips office um, for two reasons. One, uh, suggesting that um, uh, MPs have been told that they can't have certain things in their constituencies if they don't um, if they continue to pursue a vote of no confidence and also allegations that their whips office or it's certainly uh, the, op the operation have been uh, briefing against uh, MPs. So some very, very serious accusations um, and uh, giving uh, this story new momentum uh, through William Ragg's um, comments and also being endorsed by uh, a, a, our defecting MP, uh, Chris, from Bury South, um, saying that he had actually experienced this firsthand. So very unusual, uh, very uh, explosive and pretty serious allegations. And looking like it could get even more explosive. Just got the times in, Steve. Uh, Tory rebels retaliate. They say that Tory MPs who want to oust Boris Johnson are considering publishing a secretly recorded conversation with the Chief Whip and text messages after they accuse the government of blackmail and intimidation. They say the rebels met today to discuss how to respond. They were comparing notes and discussing whether or not to make public texts and other evidence they had from the whips, one member has recorded a heated conversation that they had with the chief whip. I mean, they're going great guns. This, this blue on blue is full scale now. Yeah, and one of the common features of this particular saga is evidence surfacing. <laughs> you know, you have claims and counterclaims, but then evidence comes up and notches up or ratchets up the political temperature considerably. So that will be an interesting development. It is part of what is inevitably a seismic phase in British politics. Some Tory MPs are contemplating removing a prime minister. It doesn't get bigger. And some of Johnson's allies are working overtime to try and prop him up. And when you get that dynamic, you're going to get stories like this. Um, and because there is this now gap between all the stuff that's erupted in recent days and awaiting this much-cited uh, report on the parties, 
uh, there's going to be more of this. And it is inevitable when the stakes are so high, as I say, the removal of a prime minister. Now, Johnson, lucky on one level, is relevant to tonight and what we're here for. He's got some of his newspapers holding back a bit. Um, if this were a Labour prime minister, I can tell you the Mail, the Telegraph and others would be going crazy on the front pages. They're not tonight. But it is still a huge moment in British politics and no one's quite sure which way it's going to go. And in terms of the language being used on the front pages, if we look at the Metro, which, you know, uses the word blackmail, and on the front page of The Guardian, dirty tactics, it sounds worse than the parties. Whether or not it resonates as much with members of the, uh, the public, Salma, is, is another matter. Um, but Steve used the words, this is seismic. The, people are watching how to have an 80-seat major majority and implode, aren't they? Yes, I think that's true. But I think that there is there are always huge uh, pitfalls, no matter how uh, strong the majority might be for a prime minister. The question here is about the fact that uh, a lot of this feels self-inflicted by the prime minister. The only thing that I would say about the sort of headlines of blackmail and dirty tactics, this is clearly something that has been um, said by those people accusing uh, Number 10 in the Whip's office of behaving in this way. And I do have some sympathy for the line that's coming out that's saying that we actually need to see some evidence of this because you cannot stop people from building schools and hospitals in certain areas just because they've decided to go against a certain vote. Whether that's been threatened um, or not is certainly the question, but I've never seen a process that would make that possible because actually it goes through the department it goes through rigorous checks and then once you've sort of done planning and you know talk to local authorities and lots of other stakeholders about these things that is the process by which new schools and hospitals are, are put into local constituencies so it's more than just this kind of centralized control so it would be interesting to see if there is a distinction between people suggesting this and the reality of that actually happening, because that, that seems incongruous to me. Do, do, I mean, do you see this um, as a concerted plot? Um, and in fact, in a sense, you know, is everybody being played here? You know, it's a defector to Labour via a committee chair, one of the first to put their letter in wanting Boris Johnson to go, backed by another person who's put their letter in, Andrew Bridgen, um, and we're all jumping on it. I mean, it, it, you know, do, do you have some sympathy with the, with the PM and the Downing Street team over this one, Steve? No, um, but I don't think it's um, what we're seeing here a sophisticated, coordinated uh, plot. No doubt people are talking all the time uh, and how to mount pressure, those who want to get rid of him, how to mount pressure and those who want to keep him, how to keep him. Um, but it elevates them all too much to hail coordinated plots. I think there's a degree of chaos which is part of the ingredient to this on both sides. Um, remember the new intake of the 2019 election are relatively new to politics. And this is politics, as I said at the beginning, on it doesn't get bigger, an attempt to remove a prime minister. And they are changing their minds sometimes. Yes, we're going to do it. No, we're not going to do it. So I think it's, um, as I say, elevating it all too much to imply levels of coordinated sophistication. But they are talking and they are trying to work out what move to make next. But I kind of think this is a symptom of the wider malaise at the top, not bigger than, you know, the kind of blackmail allegations and so on. Um, the crisis revolves around leadership and whether they should make a move against someone who, remember, is being accused of not only breaking his own rules, but lying about it. Now, he denies that. He's got people trying to keep him in place. But those Tory MPs who've decided those two leaps are leaps too far, uh, we don't know the final number but clearly there are a significant number who've reached that conclusion. The I, uh, if we look at that, Tory civil war, they call it. A cabinet minister um, has said Johnson faces death by a thousand cuts, as it's always unlikely you shoot and take him out in one round. The mirror is just in as well, also going on with the uh, Black May story, the lowest of the low, uh, Christian Wakeford's allegations there. And then finally, the Daily Star, Salma, is Johnson a lame duck? I mean, this is a bit of fun from them. But actually, it goes back to the question that Beth asked him earlier this week. Um, you might survive, but can you recover? And ultimately, that might end up being the, the most important question. 
In, look, I think that is the most important question because as, I, as I've been reminding people, um, you know, and Steve will know this too, but having been in the centre of government when uh, Theresa May faced her uh, leadership challenge, one can see um, the, the sort of context in which actually it just saps your authority away from you. And that is certainly a danger for Boris Johnson, that he, like Theresa May, if there is a no-confidence vote, actually survives it, um, but loses all kinds of authority and has cabinet that sort of behaves very badly around him or a parliamentary party that stops listening and sort of rebels on other issues that aren't directly linked to the number 10 parties um, or, or or anything specifically to do with this episode. So there will, there will be some um, attention on that. There's obviously the issue of what happens at the local elections and whether there's going to be losses that are linked back to this as well. Um, so there's a lot to consider and MPs are also going to ask themselves, which is why We've seen in some reporting, uh, you know, about new chiefs of staff and clearing out advisers. And people are going to ask themselves whether the prime minister can get back on the front foot in a credible way and uh, show some grip of the government. OK. Uh, going to be a busy week next week by the sounds of it, if indeed Sue Gray's report is then published. But we've got lots more to talk about. The big policy announcements of this week have been, of course, on COVID. Some schools are pushing back against the government and telling pupils to keep wearing masks. We will discuss that in The Telegraph. That's next. watching the press preview are with me now Steve Richards and Sal Michelle welcome back to both of you um, so fairly swiftly uh, some of the Covid restrictions have been lifted schools already in England uh, not mandated to wear masks and uh, the Daily Telegraph said that some schools are defying the Prime Minister over this Steve fair enough I mean once again it's uh... The, the phrase is personal responsibility, or in terms of workplaces, the head teacher's responsibility or whatever. Um, absolutely fair enough. Um, it's his decision, Boris Johnson's. It is connected with, though not wholly, but connected with his political uh, turmoil and the need to try and woo his MPs who've always loathed these restrictions. I think it is understandable and commendable that some head teachers will make their own judgment on this. Um, uh, we don't know for sure that we're out of this at all, um, even though the figures are looking good. So, yeah, the... Um, yeah, they've got every right to do it and a right to do it. Yes, relatively good, I suppose, with 107,000 cases yeah. today. It's, it is all relative, yeah. uh, if you look back to the days of Delta. Um, but the Daily Mail's picked up on this idea of the return as well. And this is uh, wanting civil servants to set an example, the suggestion in the Mail that unions will have none of it, Salma. Yes, and this is an interesting story because, again, it is that question about personal responsibility. But if you are mandated at work, uh, then how does that how does that, that actually play out? Um, but people are very, very worried about urban centres and what that's doing to offices and what that's doing to work culture and work environment and indeed what it's doing for productivity. So I can see it certainly from both sides. Uh, so, you know, the, the manager class who want to get people back, uh, for want of a better phrase, and, and those people who are either struggling because they are worried about their personal risk and they still think that actually um, the uh, COVID is still um, g going to be a, a worry for them, uh, but also people who think that the, the flexible working uh, works better and want to sort of keep a hold of that. So there's going to be that conflict, I think, uh, for some time yet. Um, I think with, with the male, which are thinking about how the civil service should set the example. That is interesting because the civil service does try to sort of borrow from what's happening in corporate Britain. Um, and so I think they probably will be trying to pursue flexible working, which will no doubt outrage the mail and uh, probably ministers as well. Yeah, Salma. Salma Shah, Steve Richards, lovely to have you both on. Thank you both very much indeed.